Listen again to the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the church said, Amen. That doxology, that beautiful hymn of praise that the Apostle Paul includes at the end of Romans chapter 11 gives us perspective. It reminds us of who God is, especially in relation to who we are. And it's important for us to know and to remember each day who God is and who we are and that we aren't God and that we just allow God to be God and not try to control him and not try to manage him, but simply to submit to him. Paul says, we can't delve to the depths of God's knowledge and wisdom. We can't fully determine his unsearchable judgments. We can't unearth his paths of understanding and we can't fully comprehend the mind of God or presume all the actions of God. And yet, sometimes we have the audacity to think that we can understand God, that we can fully somehow comprehend the complexity of who God is. Many of you know what this is, a Rubik's Cube. And you know the purpose of the Rubik's Cube. It is to turn and to twist and to try to solve this puzzle. How many of you, raise your hand, if you have ever solved this puzzle? You have solved the Rubik's Cube. Congratulations. You are part of less than 6% of the population. Did you know that? Less than 6%. How many of you are like me and the other 94%? who maybe has picked up this cube a few times and played with it and twisted a few things, maybe even got one side, maybe two sides, but then you thought, ah, that's too much trouble. You set it down and walk away, right? I read that the fastest time, the world's record for solving this puzzle is something like 4.89 seconds. Can you believe that? It takes me 4.89 seconds to say Rubik's Cube. Someone actually solved the Rubik's Cube with his feet in 25 seconds. Wow. Wow. But the idea is that you twist and turn, that you use some algorithm, some knowledge that you have to try to get every side to be its own color. And so you might twist, you might move, but then you might see, oh, I didn't do something, I, I need to go back. And so you backpedal. And the goal always when you pick this thing up is to solve it, right? I mean, don't necessarily just pick this up and play with it. I guess you could, but people typically don't. The idea is once you get your hands on this thing, the goal is to solve it. Or you just give up like I typically do. As I said, I haven't solved this. Riley is the Rubik's Cube champion in our family. He actually can solve this very quickly. But I will tell you, the competition in his family is not very great because we don't do it. But he said, hey, Dad, I can set that up, make a few turns on it, and so it looks mixed up, and then all you got to do is get up there and just do things backwards the way that I did them, and everyone will think you solved it. I thought, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And so he showed me how to do it, and this morning in my office I was practicing, and this is what I came up with. I'm not kidding you, this is actually what happened. I got it all mixed up and I couldn't do it, so there goes that plan. But in this series that we're talking about my God, the false identities we give God, today I want to give the idea or introduce the concept of the Rubik's Cube God. That somehow God is a puzzle to be solved. He is a mystery to be unlocked. He is a question to be answered. 
And that if we can just work hard enough, if we can just make enough twi twists, make enough turns, if we can just think enough and process enough, then surely we can get to the point where we can figure out God, we can solve God. And then once we do, we can just kind of set him over here because I've checked that box. I've mastered that. I fully understand who God is. And if I fully understand who God is, then, boy, I can predict God. I can know what God is thinking. I can know what God will do and should do and won't do, right? Because if I understand him, then I can control him. You see, in this mindset, discipleship becomes a quest to put God in a box, to construct parameters around God, boundaries to enclose God, to somehow get our minds around the nature of God. And that is one of the dangers of this approach. The false assumption that if I can understand God, then I can somehow control him. I can manage him. Now, we don't use the word control, and we don't say or even presume to manage God. We say things like, yes, God is God and I'm not God. But the truth is, many times, we think we can control God. That we can manage his thoughts and his behaviors. And so we read our Bibles. And we see a certain scenario, a certain situation unfold. And we assume we know how God should act. We know what God should do, what he should say, and what he shouldn't do or say. But as the story unfolds, we see that God does something different than we expect. Where did that come from? God throws us a curveball. Now, wait a second, God. I had you all figured out. I had you in a box. And now you are reaching outside of that box. And my identity for you, my understanding of you, is threatened. But it also happens in our own day and time. God doesn't act like we think he should. Like, th like we think he's supposed to. Like we think is consistent with his character. And all of a sudden, our identity for God, our image of God, is put aside or is threatened or is challenged. You see, what we have the tendency of doing is, is backing God into a corner. We've sort of constructed this thing to hold God in, to back him in a corner, and we even make deals with God, don't we? And again, we don't say this, but we, we think this and we live this way. And we say, God, this is your area. And so you do what you do, and I understand what you do, and I'll do what I do. And so as long as I keep my side of the deal, you then will keep your side of the deal. And by the way, let me tell you what your side of the deal is, right? I will go to church, I will try to be a good person, I will try to be nice to my neighbors and friends and people at work, I'll try not to say too many bad words, on Sundays I'll try to put a little money in the plate, I might even go on a mission trip, God, I'm going to do all that stuff, and let me tell you what your part is, your part is to bless me, your part is to take care of me, your part is to protect me and to make my paths straight through life. So I do my part and you do your part. And do you see what we're doing? We're putting God in a box. We're backing him in a corner. We're trying to control and manipulate and manage the God of the universe. Trying to control God is a pointless pursuit and it is dangerous. You see, this approach to God often produces arrogance in us. We develop this mentality that, that we have arrived, that we have solved the mystery. We have solved the puzzle. We've figured God out. We've unpacked any mystery there is. And as we do this, we in our minds develop this sense of certainty about God. We are certain about certain things about God. And we begin making the rules for God. No, God can't allow that. No, God won't do that. God will do this. He won't do that. 
And again, we try to control God. And as we try to control God, as we bring God down on our level so we can wrap our minds around him, what are we doing? Many times we are elevating ourselves. We're bringing God down. We're elevating ourselves, trying to be on his level. You see the danger in that. And the sense of arrogance and pride that that breeds. Deciphering God, trying to fully comprehend who God is, causes me many times to stop learning, stop growing, stop developing. Especially a dynamic theology of God. We view God as a fixed entity. The Bible says God never changes. And so we have solved the puzzle and we put it over here and God will not change from what I know him to be. We move God down to our level. There's a a term called anthropomorphism. A long word. Anthro means human. Morph means form. It means we attribute to God human attributes, human qualities. We talk about the mouth of God or the the heart of God or the hands of God or the eyes of God or the ears of God. We give him human qualities. The Bible even does that, right? And that's not necessarily wrong. We have to have words and symbols and metaphors, right, to try to relate to God, to try to get some glimpse and understanding of who God is. And so those things are important, But we need to be careful in using things like that. Because when we attribute something that we understand, eyes, ears, hands, to God, who transcends all of the physical attributes we try to ascribe him, then we have the tendency to think we more fully understand God. I know how ears work. I know how my eyes work. I know how my hands work. And so as we give those things to God, then all of a sudden we understand a part of God. And if I put enough attributes on him that I sort of understand that I began to really understand who God is. Now again, those things are great for us to relate to God. But we need to be careful that we don't limit God. The result is we often close our minds. We have arrived after all. We've solved the puzzle. And so we close our minds to new ideas, to deeper understandings, to anything that challenges the box that we put God in. Anything comes along and challenges that box, we don't know what to do. In fact, we feel threatened by that because we have taken a long time and a lot of study and a lot of introspective intellect to construct that box. So don't you dare come along and challenge that box. You see, it stops our growth. It stops our discovery. Discipleship becomes a mental exercise in knowledge rather than a spiritual pursuit in faith. Big difference. Now, does faith involve intellect and thinking? Of course it does. But discipleship and faith cannot be and should not be limited to our knowledge. It is so much more than that. In fact, that's the very attitude that Jesus often rebuked in the Jewish leaders of his day, the Pharisees and some of the other teachers of the law. They had the knowledge, but that's all they had. And Jesus says, that's not enough. In fact, that's dangerous. There's an example in John chapter chapter 5 where Jesus heals a, a paralyzed man, but it's on the Sabbath And so the the teachers of the law, some of the Jewish leaders, see that he is working on the Sabbath. And they say, Jesus, you're breaking the law. And they confront him. And Jesus just wants them to understand that he is from the giver of the law. That he was sent from God. And that he is revealing the heart of the law. So notice what Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice. There's an example of us giving 
human attributes to God. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. Don't miss that. For you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. These people Jesus is talking to, they studied the scriptures diligently, he said. But Jesus says, God's word is not in you. You say, wait a second. How can that be? They are studying the scriptures. They are reading their Bibles, is what we might say. They have the knowledge. And Jesus says, yeah, but the word of God is not in you. Why not? Because they were reading the scriptures to know about God, not to know God. They were approaching the scriptures for information, not transformation. They were looking at the law of God with their minds and not with their hearts. They approached the scriptures simply to confirm their own righteousness rather than seeing that true righteousness is found in the one sent by God, the one even in their midst. Jesus. You see, my knowledge of God does not save me. The grace of God saves me. There's not going to be a final exam to get into heaven. Sometimes we need to know that. We need to remember that. We need to to be called out on that. Because something in us wants to pull back control. We want to to think that we have some sense of control over our destiny, over knowing God. And if I can just know more, which again, knowing more is great. That's, That's wonderful. Don't mishear me. But we aren't saved by our knowledge of God. We are saved by the grace of God. We need to hear this. Job, I think, needed to hear that. Job, by the way, is a great place to go in the Bible for theology. Because it's in Job where we see the dilemma of humans colliding with the sovereignty of God. And through it, we get a glimpse, just a glimpse into the character and the nature of God. Not the full picture of God, but we get a glimpse as to who God is. You remember the story of Job probably. If you you don't remember, if you've never heard the story of Job, just know that Job lost everything, pretty much everything, was devastated. And so he, like us, when we experience suffering and loss, he confronts God. He has lots of questions for God. The same questions we ask, why God? Why is this happening? Where are you? How can this be a part of your will? God, why aren't you doing anything about this? Where is your sense of justice, God? Those same types of questions we ask. And finally, God responds to Job's inquiries. And in his response, we are reminded of something we need to know about God. If you have a Bible, look at Job 38. Job chapter 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Some versions say out of the whirlwind. You know, sometimes it just takes a storm, doesn't it, for us to to really see and hear God? God speaks to Job out of the storm. This is what he says. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Wait a second, without knowledge? God, that's all I have. My knowledge of who you are. I know who you are. I know how you operate. I have you in this box. I have solved the mystery. There's nothing left to do on the puzzle. I've mastered it. 
I have the knowledge, God. And God says, you just think you have the knowledge. You just think you know who I am. And you can almost see Job saying, well, the problem is not that I've built this box for you, God. The real problem is you keep jumping out of that box. And listen to what God says. Verse 3, brace yourself like a man. Some versions say, gird up your loins, pull up your pants, basically. Get ready, Job. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. He goes on asking Job very specific questions about very specific things in creation, in nature. And through it all, there are three questions that emerge, not questions that Job has for God. He's already asked his questions, and now it's God's turn. And God has some questions. And the questions God has for Job are, first of all, who are you? Who are you? And secondly, where were you, and are you able? Who are you, where were you, and are you able? And throughout this text, throughout this chapter, you see this common theme keep emerging of knowledge. In fact, that word know is used like six times just in this one chapter. Verse 5, surely you know. Tell me if you know all this, verse 18. Verse 33, do you know? God says, you think you have it all figured out. You think you know it all, don't you, Job? Hmm. Think again, God says. Think again. We can't know all the ways of God. We can't fully comprehend the knowledge and the wisdom of God. We can't back God into a corner. We can't put him into a box. We can't get our minds around him or understand why he always does what he does. Yes, we read the Bible and we learn much about God. But we don't get a full picture of God even from Scripture. The Bible certainly doesn't tell us everything there is to know about God. God has revealed himself in Scripture in a way that we can't understand, but in a way that is still incomplete. And so the idea is not if I master this book, then I will master comprehending, understanding who God is. That's basically God's message for Job. And that's the message we need to hear. Notice Job's response in chapter 42. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know. (laughs) Do you remember what God said about Job's knowledge? You think you know. And finally Job says, okay, here's what I really know. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. Finally, Job gets some answers. But it's not answers to the questions he was asking. It's answers to the questions that God was asking him. Do you remember those three questions? Job, who are you? And basically Job says, I am nothing. Compared to you, God, I am nothing. God says, where were you when I did all of this, when I created all these things? And Job says, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. 
And God says, are you able? Can you do what I've done? Can you explain it? Can you do it? Job has to admit, no, there's no way. I'm not, I'm not able, not at all, not even close. In 1969, in a science lab in New Jersey, Canadian physicist Willard Boyle and his colleagues invented the technology for the electronic eye. It's the device that is used even today in digital cameras. With their knowledge of math and how light behaves, they were able to develop and invent something called the charged coupled device, or the CCD. It's the same technology that is used in the, uh, the Hubble telescope and in the Mars lunar probe. And it's because of Boyle's work that we're able to, to see the surface of Mars. In 2009, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. But what's interesting is a, a few years after his invention, as digital cameras were coming onto the market, one day Boyle was in a store and he wanted to buy one of those digital cameras. And so he, he picked one up and he began to uh, be confronted by a salesman. And the salesman began to explain to Boyle how digital cameras work. And as he was explaining to, uh, to the inventor of the very thing that he was holding in his hands, the salesman got frustrated. And finally he just stopped. He said, you know what? There's just too many intricacies. It's just too complicated for me to try to explain to you. Isn't that ironic? Well, Boyle, according to his friends, was normally a very quiet, sort of humble man. But the salesperson's arrogance and disrespect really put him off. And so he simply replied to this salesman, no, no need to explain. I invented it. <laughs> no need to explain. I invented it. The salesman didn't believe him. And so finally Boyle said, just go type my name into your computer and see what comes up. Sure enough. So people began in the store to gather around and get their pictures made with him because he was the inventor of this incredible technology. You know, so many times we act like that, like that salesman with God, don't we? We tell God how he should be, what he should do, what life really should be like, how life works and how it doesn't work. And I wonder if God just doesn't sometimes want to say, thanks, no need to explain. I invented life. I invented it. Human understanding is terribly inadequate to define the divine. It just won't get us there. And last week we talked about the unscientific God. And we said that, that ration and, and, and reason and logic, that these things we discover and observe in science and nature, that they bear witness to God that they illuminate the creative power and sovereignty of God. But we also need to know that God cannot be fully explained by reasonable and rational observations, that there is much mystery and wonder and awe when it comes to God. As God reminds us, as we read in Isaiah 55, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. And so if you want to think of God as a Rubik's Cube, if this is your view of God, then let me encourage you to expand your view a bit, to add some squares, to add some rows and some columns, add thousands, add millions, Add billions of squares to this cube. This is a three by three, but now they've developed like a five by five. I don't know, maybe a 10 by 10. I can't even imagine trying to do something like that. I need a one by one. That's what I need. But imagine millions, billions of little squares, of rows and columns, trying to get your mind around how to solve that thing. 
Now, we might have computers that produce algorithms that can help us maybe get close to solving that, right? Maybe. But imagine this cube so large that no amount of human effort, no matter what machine, no matter what help we had, no matter what we used, we couldn't even turn one side. Imagine something so complex, so large, that there would be no possible way to solve it. No possible way. We could learn about it. We could admire it. We could be challenged by it. We can even experience it on some level, maybe touch it, maybe look at it. But we could never solve it. And now you begin, you begin to get a picture of who God is. God is not a puzzle to be solved. He is a God to be loved and worshiped and revered and obeyed. He is a God who wants to know us. A God who makes himself known to us so that we can do more than just know about him, we can know him in a very personal way. And so we end where we began with Paul's beautiful doxology, this beautiful hymn of praise to and about God. And what's interesting is the context. In Romans 11, Paul has been talking to the Gentiles. He's been talking to the Jews. And he's saying to all of them that you fall short, that on your own you can't do it. There is sinfulness, and that sinfulness leads to death. But mercy, the mercy of God is extended to all of you, to all of us. That salvation is found in this one who wants to live in relationship with us, who wants us to do more than know about him, wants us to know him personally, that God's mercy is poured out on us. And then he ends his sermon, you might say, with this beautiful doxology of praise. And so that's how we'll end as well. In just a moment, we'll have a song. And that's, that's our invitation song. An invitation for you to say, I want to know him. Maybe I know some things about him, but I want to know him. So much so that he brings about transformation in my life through the work of his spirit, through the work of his word. Maybe you, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures, but his word isn't in your heart, isn't in your life. And maybe you're ready for that to change. You're ready to give your life to him. And maybe that means starting a life for him. Confessing your faith that Jesus is the Son of God and being baptized into Christ. Raised to live that new, exciting, purpose-filled, hope-filled life. Or maybe for you, it's saying, I need to pull God out of that box. I need to throw that box away. And I just need to submit and listen to and admire and worship God. And you want us to pray for you and support you. We're happy to do that. I'm going to read this doxology again. If you don't mind, would you stand? After we read this, we'll sing our song. Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And the church said, amen. If we can help you, we invite you to come as we sing together. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his
his word, what a glory. 